Okay, Andrew. Andrew Holcheck or Holycheck? Holcheck. 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 Fantastic. Holacek. So, la- ladies and gentlemen, today um, our listeners, our viewers, uh, we have a very, very, very special guest with an incredible uh, background here on the uh, the Silent Ego podcast in association with Zengility Life, and. Um, as, uh, as you know, this is all about the soul of the entrepreneur, and we have a soul um, who talks to our souls. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure, Andrew, to have you on our podcast, Silent Ego. Um, for all of you that don't know of Andrew, Andrew is an author, an authority on meditation, and uh, basically he's also a musician and a dentist. He's uh, got a, an incredible uh, background. Um, He's written some fantastic books, to mention a few, Lucid Dreaming, Dream Yoga, and Death and Dying, so very interesting um, uh, subject matter. He's a spiritual teacher, and he's a student of Buddhism. And having recently uh, uh, read and listened to Andrew's material and his books, uh, there are some serious life learnings here. So I'm proud to say that... um, in our estimation here in the UK, he's been promoted as a life guide that we all should listen to um, because he's got some super teachings and we've got some fantastic learning. So, Andrew, with, uh, with that intro, what else can I say? What a, what a fabulous honour to have you here. And I've got some very interesting um, things I'd like to ask you. But uh, if you could uh, kind of warm us up with a pretty standard but hopefully thought-provoking question. How did it all come about? <laughs> uh, so I'll think, thank you so much, Ben, for the opportunity to spend some time with you. It means a lot to me. That's very generous of you. Uh, and so uh, let me ask when you ask, how did it come about? Like my introduction to the spiritual world, to meditation, to dreams, um, maybe what specifically do you want me to riff on? Yeah. So if I look at... Um sort of my recent uh, listen to be candid over the last sort of uh, couple of weeks, um, Dream Yoga. Um, That's been fascinating. And, you know, the sort of, I suppose at one end of the continuum sort of meditation, which is a really big subject on an international basis right now is humanity goes through what I would call a consciousness. It's an upgrade, let's call it that. And we're all becoming... Uh, and aware, you know, we're very much becoming uh, a lot more aware of ourselves um, because with all the circumstances we've all just been going through and continuing to go through, we're all now entering new reams of our thinking. And uh, dare I say it, I- I've now uh, coined the phrase, I'm creating a new environment to live in. And right. it starts within. Um, so, yeah, I mean, subject areas uh you know, things that I touch on, uh, particularly in the book, which was the the power of breath, oxygen is gold. And, you know, really, really fascinating, one breath away from death. I mean, you know, this is really, really sort of what I would call sense to me. And right now, um, on a global scale, I think we're all sort of feeling we're going through a lot of nonsense. Um, but hopefully there is as the, as they say, there is a a crack, but that's when the light gets in. Right. So a lot of the learnings that I got from uh, Dream Yoga um, were profound, uh, very thought provoking, and um, you know that subject matter of sleep. And I, I didn't know this, um, and maybe our listeners and viewers didn't know this, but you know Buddhist practice, they, they rarely sleep. Is that right? I mean, we, maybe let's start with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, you know, the, it, it, you know, there's a lot tossed out there. Um, lots of things to discuss. So, the last thing, you know, they don't sleep well. It's it's only really in the mind of a truly awakened one, uh, you know, a real meditation master, where the need for sleep is dramatically reduced and. What happens? It's that's really worth throwing into the mix. It's they they still. It's not like they're up twenty four seven. The the meditation masters have minds that basically simply transition from gross to subtle to very subtle bandwidths, and so they still lie down. The body may still need to re, rebalance elements and that sort of thing, 
But as you correctly suggest, they don't fall asleep in the conventional way. You, you know, the West, the Western world, the model I use, Ben, is the Western world has a kind of binary approach to consciousness. You know, you're either awake or asleep, dead or alive, yes, no kind of thing. And and mm. it's represented by a light switch model in the West. And in the Eastern approaches to mind and to meditation replaces that light switch with a kind of dimmer so what happens with these uh, advanced practitioners, kind of these Olympic athletes of the mind, is they simply transition from gross to subtle to very subtle, and they maintain this lucidity. And so lucidity, in, in the idea of lucid dreaming, uh, lucidity is a code word for awareness. A, a lucid dream yeah. is when you're aware of the fact that you're dreaming. So someone with that level... Basically, their awareness just transitions from gross to subtle to very subtle states. And so that part is definitely true. They, they maintain this very subtle thread of constant consciousness. It's not just Buddhists, by the way. Uh, anybody who works with these subtle dimensions has access to these domains. And on that level, they don't really sleep as we know it. And, and interestingly enough, as you know, Ben, even the word Buddha, right, comes from a Sanskrit root that means the awakened one. And it literally means someone who's w woken up to the nature of mind and reality. And, and therefore, quite literally, their sleep is, in fact, positively affected in this way, for sure. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Just to sort of just uh, – so you, you, just a quick uh, course correction, Andrew. You're talking to Paul, um, so um, not Ben. <laughs> so just oh, to I'm sort so of, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, thank yeah, you for so, um, that. That is totally my bad. I'm sorry, Paul. My bad. No, that's okay. No, 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 no. It's absolutely fine. Um, but uh, you know, one. So just coming back to that, I. Uh, so what I what I really sort of am keen to, kind of pull from today in, in this conversation is firstly, um, coming at it from what we stand for in Silent Ego and Zengility Dot Life, which is our huh? business. We are hundred percent people centric, and nice. we're going through this huge change and you know we've been very selective about you know unfortunately unfortunately we've been very selective about people that we're working with right now but there seems to be um huge change in the way that we're actually going to practice life and we're picking this up from a dare i say it from a commercial perspective businesses mm -hmm. are starting to um start to talk a lot more about purpose and meaning and um, they're valuing things in a different way. They're almost recycling what was to what can be. So mm -hmm. we're on this sort of journey of awareness, awakening. And dare I say it, the senses are telling us that leadership are grasping now for a new way. And I call it, we're moving away from the capitalistic values and reaching what I call, dare I say it, life capitalism, where we're putting life at the front and centre of our our minds. And I think meditation is now, dare I say it again, becoming common practice or a common yeah. term. But you've took it to a whole new level, Andrew. And that's what's fascinated me about your books, that, you know, the best is yet to come. You, you, your timing couldn't be better. We're all reaching out now to go in to come out. And I think we spent too much time out and, you know, the term that you use, which I was absolutely blown away with, was the dogs and the lion um, right. and the yeah. stick. And I said it, it said it all. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I'd like to just expand a little bit on that sort of coinage because it means so much. You know, it's it's very sage in, in uh, and I think it was the sage, wasn't it, that that, that sort of expressed, the, the, you know, the dog and the lion and the stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. This is this is a great set of topics. Thanks for bringing it this direction. So, yeah, this is colossally important. I mean, I mean, actually, my friend, in in the Buddhist tradition, it's of such centrality and such importance that the actual word for Buddhist in Tibetan Nangpa means literally insider, and non-Buddhist is is literally chipa. The word means outsiders, and so. This is so fascinating to me, exactly as you're suggesting. E even Chardin, you know, the the, the uh, paleontologist, anthropologist, mm. basically talked about how it is that evolution really hasn't stopped. It's just moved indoors. And this is precisely what the meditation trajectories are about. They're about reversing our infatuation with externality, with, with materialism, with consumption, mm. with 
capitalism in the pejorative sense. And so when I talk about, I mean, let me explain to our listeners this notion of what's called the lion's gaze, because you you, you mentioned this metaphor that's um, in the tradition that's really quite a beautiful one, which is that um, if you throw a stick out and away from a dog, I have a dog, so I do this all the time, the dog chases after the stick. This is analogous to what we do with an untamed, untrained mind. We're always leaping out and away, chasing after thoughts, chasing after things, basically yanking us away from ourselves and what's truly important. And so the lion's gaze um, metaphor is basically if you throw a stick um, out and away from a lion, the lion chases you. It doesn't chase the stick. And so the lion's gaze <laughs> is about turning the lens of the mind and the heart. By the way, the same word in, in uh, Sanskrit and Pali, heart, mind, it's the same thing. So this is parenthetically a very important interjection that when you work with meditation, you're not just working with your mind, you're working with your heart mind. So there is this affective emotional component. That's actually quite important. But the, the really important point here um, is really... Paul, as you nailed it, even Jung, Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, put it this way when he mm -hmm. said, he who looks outside dreams, he who looks within awakens. And so I think part of what's happening here that you seem to be suggesting, and I completely agree, is that the current age, the blessing of the current age is, in fact, the more reflective capacity. Let's take a look inside. Let's use these meditative tools to really see what fundamentally is going on, because otherwise we're simply just continually chasing sticks and that becomes mm -hmm. the entirety of our lives. And so um, as you suggested, Paul, as well, in my work, I take this narrative of the inward journey and, and I, I ramp it up a little bit and say, geez, it's not just what we do with the daytime or diurnal mind that we can work with in this capacity, but also the nocturnal mind. There's a vast natural resource every night that we can tap into if we have some of these techniques of lucid dreaming and dream yoga that then really points the mind in the right direction. Because it, what is, how does a country song go? We're looking for love and happiness in all the wrong places. And we think that yeah. something external will make us happy. Well, really, we're, we're mixing metaphors. We're eating the menu instead of the meal. And we're getting fat instead of getting full because we're not really consuming the right thing. What we want to consume is experience itself not these external substitute gratifications. So I'll pause and, and come up for air to see where you want to go with this. But this is this alone is a really important central topic. So thanks for bringing it up. Well, it, yeah, no, no, that's great. And Andrew, once again, it's a pleasure. The, I mean, the learnings are endless, you know. Um, you know, so, so I'm coming at it from a, the, you know, our listeners and viewers um, in the coming weeks are going to be chief executives of, you know, businesses. That's the community Excellent. that we're operating. Excellent. But to be candid... We're liberating the world from work with our sister business called uh, Zengility.life, which is all about, you know, it stands for calm environment. And it's a, it's a service that really is, you know, principled on kind of ancient wisdom for modern right. times, dare I use that lever, um, to go within. So if we look at what's happened, you know, over the last... 18 months, et cetera, that we've all gone in and we call that home is where the heart is. Mm -hmm. So people are now genuinely going through those sort of reflective times and learning new um, skills of contemplation and meditation. I thought it was just so timely, us crossing paths through uh, through Ben's introduction. It's He's my business partner in Zengility.life. And, you know, we have a couple of podcasts. One is called Screaming Hearts. Uh -huh. And Screaming Hearts is a podcast related to corporate executives that are looking to get out and um, find new meaning and purpose and reach new steers of, of life. Uh, and we call that, coin that phrase, life capitalism versus capitalism, life first, you know, becoming more heart-centered. So if we look at, you know, birth, rebirth, renaissance, um, you know, the rebirth of, of how we're going to practice life over the coming decades. This, you know, the insights, Andrew, that genuinely we've learned, and I listened to some material on Lion's Raw over the weekend that you'd uh, participated in, uh, mm -hmm. the Buddhist com the community, and it was, it, this is all, you know, very linked with how, we're going to build new constructs of how we uh, think and create those calm environments, starting with our minds. 
and and our hearts. And I think, you know, Harvard now are talking about heart centered leadership. It's been around for a while, and you know, um, but what am I really trying to say here? The spirit of business. Mm-hmm. Um, but who wants to be busy, right? Um, we want to find more harmony and balance. And I think you talk about this quite a lot in your your tutorials and, you know, my research. And, um, you know, once again, it's all about sort of um, appreciating more love and connection with one another and creating that sort of family centricity. So if we if we come back to silent ego and I'll come up for uh, yeah, in a second, yeah. it's all about the soul of the entrepreneur. So if we look at going back to ancient times of how we prospered, the alchemy of what we we came up with, you know, how we practiced with community collaboration as we move over the next decade from what I hope we move from, which I'm liberating is fight, you know, fear, fight and competition. And we reach more truth, trust and collaboration um, in our system, um, which has always been there, but we've never accessed it. You know, or we should, we we, we have, but we haven't done it, um, pardon the language, as common practice. So Mm -hmm. with that in mind, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of nature there, what I'm talking about. And... um, you know, it starts with a, a phrase that when we gave birth to Zengility.life, people said, what's the next big thing, Paul? I said, life's the next big thing. What else yeah. is there? Yeah. Right. And yeah. I said, the next question was, you know, come on. You know, I said, well, the currency of the 21st century is how you think. Yeah. And everything comes out of that. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to touch on how you express fear, because there's a lot of unnecessary fear out there right now as we move from that paradigm of fear that that chapter of you know that decade or three (laughs) fear to bridging what i call truth trust and collaboration that's the mission we're on i think that's the mission you've been talking about for a long time (laughs) and uh you know and, and and sort of you know building a new vibration a new energy um that that's kind of where we're at with this so, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to, to talk about that. But I also want to put a little exclamation point, something that you're, you were yeah. alluding to something here, Paul, is super important. That, you know, in a conventional way, and, and this is this is part of the invitation, like, like you were suggesting with COVID, this kind of we're forced indoors, we're forced to look at things in a different way. And uh, the reason I mentioned this is that in, in a conventional way, when we work with, when we look within, when we work with our mind and meditation and the like, it gives us a power, the, 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 uh, the capability to work with what's really going on here. And by this, what I mean is that in a conventional sense, and I invite people to really take a deep dive and look for themselves to see if this is true. When you're looking for things like money, power, and fame, which really defines in so many ways the, the capitalist agenda, um, and even you could say the American dream. Mm-hmm. To me, the invitation, and I, 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 I put this forth to your listeners, is what are you really looking for? In other words, when you look at the qualities of money, power, and fame, what do these acquisitions actually bring about for you? And I, I really encourage people to say, okay, I, I want power. Write down what does power do for you. Write down that list. Mm-hmm. What does power mean to you? Do the same thing with fame. Do the same thing with money. Write down what do those qualities mean to you? Why are you so insatiably driven to acquire these things? And then what I put forth is a very revelatory investigation is where, in fact, are these qualities like power, let's say, gives you a sense of accomplishment, security, recognition, satisfaction. You can make this list for anything you're looking after trying to acquire. Where are these experiences actually registered? Well, they're registered in the mind. So fundamentally, what happens really in the deepest sense is these external pursuits or substitute gratifications for what we're really after. What we're truly after is a particular quality of heart and mind. That's what we really want. That's where life takes place. And because we don't know better, because we're driven by these unconscious narratives of the Western capitalist outward bound trajectory, 
we we end up chasing all these shadows. We end up looking again for substitute gratifications. And so this is colossally important transition, like we started at the outset, from the external to the internal move. Because really what you're looking for, and this is why the great realized awakened masters from any wisdom tradition, they fundamentally, materially, they have nothing. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi allegedly died. You could put all his possessions in a shoebox. He had nothing. But spiritually and, and uh, mentally, psychologically, he had everything. And then conversely, like you, I've had the great interesting opportunity to spend time around some of the richest people on the planet, billionaires, mm. who are sometimes, mm. uh, you know, as miserable in direct proportion to the level of wealth. They materially have everything, but spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, they're impoverished. So I think this, I want <clears throat> to, excuse me, really emphasize this point, Paul, because if, if we take this to heart, that in itself is a colossal tectonic shift, just exactly what you mm. said at the outset. So make this investigation. Write down these lists. What do you really want? Where are these qualities experienced? Where are they registered? It's not out there. We confuse an external state with a state of mind. That's what we're after. So why not work with the heart and the mind directly with meditation, as the wisdom traditions put forth? Now you're looking for what you really want. Now you're eating the meal and not the menu. And this brings about great satisfaction. And so, you know, Joseph Campbell talked about this when he said mm. famously in, in the, the power of myth that we think we want a sense of you know, purpose and, and, and whatnot in life. We think we want this. But really what he argued is what we want is, is a fuller experience of life itself. That's what we really want. And so, again, using the, the everything you're talking about, the lion's gaze versus the dog's gaze, the lion's gaze, the, the gaze of internality, the gaze of contemplation and reflection. And we, again, we have these technologies from the wisdom traditions. They hit the real sweet spot. They allow us to go directly to what it is that we're truly after. And again, don't take my word for this. Just test it against your own experience. See if it's true. If you really take this to heart, this is a game changer. It will save you a ton of time and money. It will save you so much heartache. It would also help us heal the planet. Because otherwise, what do we think? Well, we think more acquisition is necessary. <clears throat> more power, more money, more fame, more possessions. Well, we're killing the planet and therefore we're killing ourselves if this external trajectory is not interrupted. So I really wanted to put an exclamation on that before I turn to the topic of fear, because this is so important. No, I agree. And, and, and you know, I, I coined the phrase, who's consuming who? Exactly. You know, and yeah. if you look at that, I mean, pardon the language, let's talk death for two seconds. Every tombstone will have consumer, born in, died in. Yeah. Right. And, right. Yeah. Who's going to, well, how can you change that? So I suppose, you know, I, I completely empathize and agree with this in the sense that most people we're talking to at exec level right now, which is interesting. Yeah. So this is coming from anecdotal experience and research. I'm, you know, the standard executive coming out of the capitalistic environment is saying, I'm looking for now a broader sense of fulfillment and completion. So, you know, there's that sort of, it is now the start, the vibration is now becoming more heart centric, but nice. how do I access it? So coming yep. back to the tools, overcoming the, you know, spreadsheet driven businesses that have got no soul. So I sold my soul yep. for some antidepressants called um, a job title and a big salary. You know, it's coming to the end now and, and it's, it, it's evident all over the world, hopefully. Yeah? Hopefully. yeah, hopefully. And I think that people are seeing through status anxiety because we're now limited in how we can express our wealth in that respect with, you know, the conditions that have been implemented, etc. So once again, home is where the heart is. Everybody's going in to come back out. And but I think that there are some fears because mm -hmm. it's change and, you know, Learning to trust yourself is is a big subject. You know, it's a very deep subject because most people um, associate with, like you said, a, a material attachment. And without that, it tends to sort of leave them feeling naked. But I think, you know, overcoming that fear, um, which is, you know, I always call it false evidence appearing real, um, 
you know, you talk about it a, a little bit in the books about that sort of illusion, I think you called it, um, or delusion. I can't remember the phrase now, but if you could just expand on that, that would be very useful for our listeners about how you see fear or, or, or the subject of fear. Yeah. These are such, such important topics, Paul. Thank you for bringing this up as well. Yeah, this is another, again, powerful invitation to look to see if, in fact, what I'm about to say is true for you. Uh, uh, the way to work with fear, in, in my estimation, and, and this is, again, of tremendous importance, because fear is primordial. Fear is, is absolutely, first thing we need to do is understand that fear is, in fact, absolutely necessary for biological survival. So my approach to working with fear is an integral approach, which means honoring and including its place in the spectrum of psychospiritual human evolution while also keeping it in its place. And by this, what I mean is that if we didn't have fear in our genetic makeup, in our very structure, you and I would not be here, Paul, talking about the nature of fear. We would have been a chicken McNugget on the Serengeti. We need fear in order to survive. <laughs> So fear, this is so important, fear protects form. And so we need to understand that, realize that we still need this healthy biological level of fear to survive. But here's the kicker, is we start to, to really transcend the limitations of biological evolution. We therefore need to transcend the biological legacy, uh, uh, literally in our DNA, that can really serve to flip evolution into devolution. So therefore, the fear that really got us to this point in human evolution now starts to retard evolution because we become afraid of working into the unknown. We become afraid of losing connection to security, to stability, and the like. And therefore, an integral approach where we honor and incorporate fear where it really belongs, and we keep it there. We need to be afraid when we step out and that truck is coming at us, we need fear to jump out of the way. But then that same fear usurps. It transcends its uh, kind of rightful place. And now it, it really can hold us back. And so the way to work with fear at this level, Paul, and this is so important, especially on the meditative path, is that if we look uh, at the actual origin of the word fear, it comes from a root, F-A-R-E, as in toll, this is right. really provocative to me. Fear is therefore the toll that we really have to pay for authentic growth. And so therefore, my entire life, and I have lived my life in this way, wow. is that if we define it properly, Joseph Campbell again very famously said, follow your bliss. Yes, that has provisional validity. It's absolutely true. But I think it also has more power, in my estimation, as someone who really wants to grow and evolve in this life. Follow your fear, because fear is always a minion of ignorance. Fear will actually show you where you need to go to grow. And so, therefore, if we alter our relationship to this foundational component of, of the human condition, we can, again, understanding the integral aspect of it, that we need to honor and incorporate it, we can actually use instances of fear and anxiety as opportunities for really authentic growth, because fear is an indicator of where um, this kind of javelin of our evolution really wants to take us, but our biological legacy is holding us back. So I can I can say definitely more about this. There's actually um, some very interesting mm -hmm. psychological data. I can and exercises, you know, brief exercise I can give sure. to your listeners. But I just wanted to pause and see if that's landing I, with you. I, I think that. Um you know, meeting of minds here, Andrew, I, I've just kept sprung when you were talking about the, you know, I've heard fear expressed in so many different ways, but you've just put it in such a, such a way that, you know, it's highly informative for people right now, particularly in the world that I'm serving with uh, Ben, my business partner, there is a lot of fear, um, a lot of fear of change. So an example with Zengility.life, we're helping people, liberating them from the corporate work world into which is a dependent world, let's call it that, which is offered dependency to ind independency. So they want to come away from that to become independent practitioners of their, their craft, their skills, executive, um, and then become interdependent with their community. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're saying, you know, you can run a portfolio lifestyle business um, and it's all about accessing you 
you know, looking at yourself as the trading asset, just to sort of commercialize that. But one of yeah. the real hinge points, um, one of the hinge points, and I, I suppose I'm commercializing spirituality here, um, but one of the hinge points is, and we run thought shops, Andrew, not workshops, thought shops. Oh, where, Yeah, and, and maybe we discuss that at some point around fear because I think that education in itself, uh, or awareness, should I say, is uh, highly thought provoking and, you know, embrace it, go with it because it's an interesting journey. And that's what people are truly looking for, but are denying themselves. So that's another thing that I think you touched on in the book. And I'm going to come back to a subject of mass distraction, which I love, by the way, and ignorance, you know, the subject of ignorance, which we're ignoring the obvious. Okay. And, this is something I really got, um, and and then just to, so, so for the record, I've been listening to your material for a little while over the last few weeks in preparation for meeting you, Thank you. Uh, as you do, because uh, I personally, as you can tell, I, f- I find the subject matter deeply interesting, and it's really you know it's underpinning the way we're going from a from a business perspective. Uh, and by the way, we're looking for a new word other than busyness, um, and right. you know. Uh, People are now looking for more flow in their lives. And, you know, we've seen now that what I would call the the blend of work and life is coming together. Um, you know, the, the, the alchemy of who we are is starting to blend nicely. We call it rose gold. You know, the elements, it's all blending. Nice. And um, But that ignorance and that denial um, is, 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 is really interesting because... Once again, we're living too far removed from ourselves. Yeah. So the new identity, let's call it that, and a lot of people now are in transition. They're losing things like job titles, salaries, you know, as, as the world, you know, the, wor- the work-life world starts to evolve and people start to, you know, rethink how they administer their, their skills. And I think there's a, there's a huge heart-centric play here people are now starting to feel what they you know and and sense do i use that word sense they're starting to sense within themselves that i've now you know i've suffered a lockdown or whatever you know we we haven't been able to sort of do what we've normally done it's given me a deep sense of a new a new realm of um what are called uh sensations are starting to arrive i'm starting to gravitate towards i don't want to do this anymore i want to do this and um, but then overcoming the the fear. Um, so I think that message for our listeners and our viewers is go with it. Am I right? Go with it because it's yeah. your biggest teacher. Yes, exactly. So pay attention. You know, the, the, the most important thing I recommend here, Paul, for people, and it does take a little bit of courage, actually. And, and this is why so many contemplative traditions are actually, they're actually called warrior traditions because they invite you to look at things that normally we want to put our heads in the sand. We want to run away from them. They're warrior traditions because they, they help you relate to your mind, to reality instead of, instead of from it. And, and by this, what I mean specifically in relationship to fear is one of the most important things to do to understand is not to try to get rid of your fear, but to establish a new, more sane and integrally informed relationship to it. And so how do we actually do this? This sounds good. Well, well, geez, what, how do we do it? Well, if we're armed with this view, then when we feel this fear, we can become intensely curious about it. We can allow ourselves to be with it, to explore it, because these insights that I'm sharing, they come largely from my own personal experience where I I have felt intense fear. I work a lot in the death and dying environment. I've I've written books on it. And parenthetically, when you talked earlier about um, fear of change, well, fear of change is is just a a micro instant of fear of death. I mean, that's what change represents. And so on an archetypal level, what I'm talking about now absolutely positively can go all the way to the great primordial fear, which is the fear of death itself. But I just put that as a side to really invite people to look, establish a relationship to this inevitable lifetime partner. Don't really try to get rid of it. Don't try to run from it. That's what we basically spend most of our lives doing, basically trying to Mm. avoid this fear. Establish a relationship to it. What is it made of? Really pause, reflect. It's a form of what's called analytic meditation. 
look deeply into the nature of this fear. One thing, Paul, that this reveals that's so interesting is that fear and its kissing cousin, anger, if you look at these two kind of primordial emotions, one common ingredient to both of them is they're highly solid, they're highly concretizing, or the more technical term is they're highly reifying states. And so therefore, understanding that in itself is really revealing because it shows that when people default into fear, when they default into anger, part of the reason they do it, and they don't know that this is the reason, it's unconscious impulse, is that when you think about fear, you think about anger, <clears throat> it makes you feel really solid. And so that in itself is very interesting. Like, why is that so important to you? What, what does that actually serve you? From a biological point of view, of course, it serves a great deal because it allows us to therefore work in, in a um, biological way with our so-called external environment. But the invitation here is look at the nature of this fear. <clears throat> Don't be afraid to go directly into it. Be with it. Establish a relationship to it. And so, therefore, when fear continues to arise, you will have a more intimate relationship to this lifetime partner, and you'll understand it. Oh, there's this contraction again. There's this <laughs> fearful, solidifying emotion again. And instead of trying to run from it, you be with it. And then the more you do that, Paul, the more you soften that relationship, the more that fear yeah. starts to lose its power over you. And this is where real fearlessness comes from. Fearlessness does not come from getting rid of your fear. Fearlessness comes from going into and through your fear. And in so doing, whoa, this is a big deal. I mean, parenthetically, in the West, can't, fear is so fundamental, you can campaign on it. Look what the previous administration did. It's yeah. highly marketable. It's contagious because it's so primordial. And therefore, it's very easy from kind of an egoic perspective to default into that fear think hole. And that becomes mm -hmm. highly problematic. That will stop you dead in your tracks. That will keep you from making any important change. And it therefore will propel you into a somewhat disingenuous and inauthentic life. And so if you want to really leave, live life with a, not on a pilot light level, but with the gas really on, we really have to establish a relationship to these primordial states of mind so that they no longer control us, that they no longer limit us. And therefore we live, you know, the great spiritual masters, Paul, and I've had the great good luxury of being around. Mm. One common ingredient that is so admirable that I try to emulate is they really live with a fearless gusto. They live life just full on because they understand so deeply the nature of fear and what it means to be fearless. So does, does that make sense to you? Does that land with you? Oh, very much so. I mean, the message is loud and clear. Work with it. Um, Relate so to build it. A new, from it. Yeah. Yeah, work with it. Um, you don't run from it. It could be your best friend. Yeah. So learn to embrace. And, Absolutely. you know, I think that's, that, is, that is very, very interesting, which lead, genuinely leads me on to sort of we, you talk about, and, I, and we all suffer this with the age we're in with, you know, we're, we're backing nature, by the way, versus technology. It's a fine blend of technology, but nature always eats last. So that's the message we, we yeah. have. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a message we live by here. So distraction, mass distraction, oh, right. you mention it in, in the book. And, yeah. wow, are we going through mass distraction right now? Um and, you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, since, you know, I've always been, as you probably pick up over the last, you know, quite a number of years, I've followed spirituality and, you know, I, I've, I've, you know, I've met people like Wayne Dyer and, you know, uh, the, nice. the likes and, um, you know, I, I read, I've read and listened to quite a lot of his stuff as, uh, as well, but I think you take it to a new level and I think you take it to a very practical level you don't talk about it. You, 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 you know, you're, you've got tools and techniques. And I think all of your material, your books are so insightful. You've been candid. It te they take a little while to absorb because you're coming out with what I would call a lot of freshness. And, you know, that subject of fear, what I would call blind ignorance, yeah. um, you know, um, learning new skill. These are all internal sort of skills that I think – a really fresh and, and, and energizing, which brings me on to, uh, we didn't realize, but you're a, a musician as well, right? Yeah, and, um, 
you know, so we talk about, I look at, you know, we're all instruments. We're all playing an instrument. You know, we're all vibrating. We're all giving off an energy. And, you know, I found that quite cathartic in the, in the last sort of couple of years about how, you know, we need to build that um, resilience through our vib, you know, our energy vibration, you know, that, that, that pardon the language, but that protection that, you know, from these sort of like distractions, which brings me on to this distraction, this mass distraction piece. I mean, I'd, I'd love you to just to expand on that because it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a big subject right now in the world. Yeah, I mean, you're pinging on some really great topics. I just want to say ever so briefly, because I, I want to return, I think, more practically to this issue of distraction. But I just want to say very briefly that this notion of, of the vibratory nature of reality is of paramount importance. And just as a sidebar yeah. for the deeper divers, dive into the to string theory in quantum mechanics, dive into what's called the Spandakatakas, which is a classic vibratory doctrine in Kashmir Shaivism. I just want to throw that for the deeper divers. This notion of reality being made, really be, the music of the spheres, that fundamentally it is vibratory in nature, even thoughts are vibrations, atomic particles are vibrations. Everything fundamentally is is this kind of symphony. Um, ah, this is such a deep topic, but I just wanted to, to put a little statement on that just to, to um, invite readers to explore this. It's a really deep topic. The distraction thing, Paul, is really uh, another great one. The word, I'm a huge fan of word origins. As In fact, I'm a student of origins altogether. The word literally means to pull apart, distract. And so uh, the distraction works. This is exactly what follows a narrative that we talked about that you landed, um, planted at the outset. Distraction, in fact, is what pulls us apart, out, and away. And so when we talked at the outset about the inner versus the outer, well, the distraction narrative is of, of such centrality, again, that it really, unfortunately, um, waters down so much of our life where we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're constantly involved with external pursuits. And in fact, in the, in the great wisdom traditions, as you probably know, what's called the Kali Yuga in Hinduism, we are in this dark age. And one of the, the kind of paradoxical signatures of the dark age is in fact our infatuation with artificial light. We're always mm. drawn out and away. And artificial light, it's very interesting, which by the way is spreading across the world, light pollution and the thing. We're always being distracted. And so as you suggest, there's this common, somewhat common lingo now, you know, these weapons of mass distraction, you know, like I have my yeah. Apple phone <laughs> I just took off, I have my smartphone, I've got all these little gadgets all these instances of artificial light that are so ready to pull me out and away. And so what we do to make this practical, if we capitulate to these distracting agendas, we in fact lead an inauthentic life. And there's a very famous study, the title of which is A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. And what they did, just to, this is worth saying, what these scientists did was using smartphone technology, they pinged people randomly throughout the day and asked them, like, what are you doing right now? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And, and their studies showed that over, I think, around 50% of the time, if not more, people were distracted. They weren't really in the present moment. And therefore, they, through their study and analysis, they determined that the level of distraction is actually directly proportional to the level of discontent. And this, again, makes total sense to what we were talking about at the outset. If we're looking outside in a way, pulling away, distracting from what we really want, well, no surprise that a consequence of that is, in fact, unhappiness, dis-ease. And so with these mass, weapons of mass distraction, each one of which is faster, more updated, pulling us out of the way, becoming more and more um, kind of deleterious and, and damaging, we, we ramp up the signature of the dark age. But as you said earlier as well, Paul, what's so interesting in kind of a Taoist fashion, that mm -hmm. co-emergent with this darkness is light, the mindfulness revolution, the thing that you're doing, the work that you're doing. And so again, if we have this view, then it can inform us both personally and collectively to do something about it. Let's look at this phenomenology of distraction. What does in fact, how does it serve us? Well, it, it basically from an egoic level, which is a limited mm. bandwidth of developmental level, 
Distraction serves to keep us seemingly comfortable and away from things like fear and pain and so-called unwanted states. And so, again, on a relative level, distraction does serve a purpose. Like I, in, my, in my clinical practice, when I'm about to deliver an injection, I do a type of distraction therapy where I'll, I'll do all these <laughs> distraction things so that when I deliver the injection, the patient doesn't feel it. So distraction does have, again, in an integral way, does have that kind of noble quality. But on a collective level, it's it's we're heading towards this cliff because we're distracting ourselves from what really matters, tying into what we were talking about earlier. And so here again, con converse, or I shouldn't say converse, in, in relationship to this diagnosis comes also the prescription. So the diagnosis is too much distraction, um, too much uh, disconnection from what's really happening. The prescription is work with non-distraction. This is this is a, a remedy. We can flip our default mode network using neuroscientific language from a default into distraction into a default into what? Presence, mindfulness, mm -hmm. awareness. Mm -hmm. Precisely what the contemplative meditative traditions are designed to do. And so this is why um, I often talk about these contemplative practices is a form of what I call stealth help, which means there's more going on than meets the eye. When you're working with these meditations, they can seem without understanding, pretty esoteric, pretty detached, pretty inapplicable. They have tremendous implications and applications because the more we come together in our own um, being, the more we center ourselves around our hearts, what's really important, the more we center ourselves in what's really happening, which is the present moment, then more, then that becomes contagious. Then that sense of centeredness in, in presence becomes contagious. And this is the genius, the beauty, the elegance of what's happening with the meditation mindfulness revolution that, you know, uh, emergent at the same time with all this darkness are these antidotes of light. And this is why I have to say, I want to applaud you and Ben for what you're doing, because in so many ways, we could say that the untamed acquisition oriented business world is a real mm -hmm. source of problem. And so you guys, it's so fantastic what you're doing. You're using your skill set. You're going directly into some of the darkest arenas of, of our social exactly. cultural reality. And you're trying to, in an alchemical way, you're trying to flip it and bring wisdom and light and compassion because, you know, you yeah. realize even though our storylines may be different, we all, as the Dalai Lama says, we all share the same human heart and mind. We all want the same foundational things. We want happiness. We don't want suffering. And so, therefore, I love what you guys are doing. It's so brave. It's so needed. And the fact that it's actually succeeding is indicative of the fact that people are longing for this. This is really, you're yeah. pointing out to them things that they may really be after. And so, yeah. therefore, I just wanted to say a deep bow of gratitude to what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. And that's fantastic. And thank you, Andrew. It means an awful lot. It really does. And, um, you know, we, we look at our business as a family. And uh, it's all that for, for Zengility particularly was inspired from uh, uh, um, an epiphany moment I had around the bees, um, oh, the, wow. the, the honeybees. Yeah. And we, we have a hive. And people are coming and going. And, you know, obviously, we're not too happy about the odd wasp that we meet. But um, other than that, um, we're here to sort of, you know, um, bring people into our hive and send them out with their alchemy. So it's, uh, you know, that that's the sort of like the view that we're actually taking. But as we sort of come down to closing down, I'm not going to talk too much on this subject because maybe another day. But, you know, um, you know. What when we you talk about fear and the link with death? Yeah. What if? What if that if we when we die we wake up, right? And it's kind of so. There's that question to be answered at another time, obviously. But um, it, it's it, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? And um, but I think you know coming at it from the greater good. You know, I'm I'm feeling very encouraged with what's happening in the world. I mean, I think that it's it's like all things. I think we're going to need to traverse. Um, it's going to take time, so patience. But equally, I think people people want what we have, and I think people are reaching in now. So, what what is something that's quite interesting for all of our listeners and viewers today? 
if we look at heart centric thinking, let's call it coin coin like coin it like that. We've all had children, and the first thing that you hear when you go for your scan with your children, when your wife is laying there and you're doing the scan, is the heartbeat. Mm. There's no sign of the brain, right? But there's the sign of the heart. The heart comes first. So that, that's, that's kind of like my view of it, unless somebody's going to tell me something different. But that registers with me. And it said, it's now time that we woke up and started to listen to our hearts. And, and I believe people are. I genuinely do. And I think it's starting with home is where the heart is. And people are now, I call it coin the phrase kitchen talk. I think people now are having more family centric uh, conversations in the kitchen of what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to do it? You know, with the adversities that some people are actually challenged with. And, but you've genuinely endorsed um, with your material that there is a way. And it's always sat within you. It's now learning how to reach it. And I'm going to, you know, come back to some of the Tao, which is principled on simplicity. And, you know, I, I wrote, you know, something down that I took from your book, strangely enough. I'm not sure whether it was highlighted, um, but it was something that I felt. And I'm a kind of 4 a.m. 4 a. riser, so I'm always up in the kitchen <laughs> you know, having some coffee and listening to your material. And I'm thinking, so what did I come out of it? Nothing is everything and everything is nothing. Yeah, <laughs> it was that sort of that, that sort of message I got from your material, which was which was nice and comfortable. You know, <laughs> it, it sort of gave me a sort of um, a, a real warm reflection on your on your material. But look, as we move forward to sort of wrapping our very, um, I think, hopefully very thought provoking conversation and I hope our listeners and viewers have enjoyed this. I've certainly got some learnings and, you know, nobody knows everything. And I certainly um, feel that dream yoga and lucid dreaming is now part of my, dare I say it, ritual and routine on a daily basis nice. um, because I found it just amazing. And I, and I recommend everybody, um, this is genuinely not a plug. This is what it is. You know what we stand for. Um, we, we've just talked to a real soul who subject matter expertise is second to none. And he's touching all of the great subjects that we all need to learn um, and take his guidance. But overall, and I'm sure, Andrew, you can wrap on this. Things are simple when you think they're simple, Right. They really are, Paul. That's a, another great point. Fundamentally, this is amazing, really. What, what we really want is fundamentally very simple. It's actually hiding in plain sight. And so the vast complexity of the modern life is really masking. It's, again, part of this distraction that keeps us away from these very simple agendas that really are, in fact, about the heart and the mind. And and so that's one reason these contemplative tools are so beautifully effective and powerful because they're very simple and look for yourself. Complexity doesn't stand yeah. a chance against simplicity. So these, these disarming practices really bring us back to centrality, to our heart, to what's really important. And I want to say just a few things here, Paul. It's very interesting. When you go to Asia, I spent a lot of time doing volunteer work there. It still never ceases to amaze me. When you go to Asia and people talk about mind, they never point to their head, never. They point to their heart. They point to their wow. heart. And so really, and, and, and also even in, in deep kind of Indic philosophical approaches, like I alluded to earlier, this is where the mind resides. The mind resides in the heart center. And so like you, I, I love the, the optimism that you share because it's so important. It's so easy to capitulate to the darkness, to the shadow sides. But the, the wisdom traditions, again, we can learn so much from them because even though these were brought about by ancient um, masters and thinkers, contemplatives thousands of years ago, again, their storylines were different than ours. But the heart-mind is the same. And so therefore, the great wisdom that they put forth thousands of years ago can help us today. And, and the reason I mention this is that the radical proclamation from the, especially these non-dual wisdom traditions sometimes translated that the very nature of the human is basic goodness, that fundamentally within mm. we are basically good. Not only that, some traditions say we're actually divine. There's this perfect purity. 
That's who we really are, Paul. That's that's who we really are. And so everything else is a distraction. Everything else pulls us away from this utter simplicity, this nobility of our basic goodness, of our really inherent divinity, the purity, the divine within. And so this is a wonderful way to come full circle, to talk about how most of the Western world pulls us out and away from that. That's why there's so much discontent and it's not working because we're looking in the wrong direction. These environmental crises, the COVID and everything, perhaps they're forcing us to look more deeply. And so therefore we can send the lens of our heart mind back to where it really belongs, to the home, to the center, to the heart. And therefore, lo and behold, we may surprise ourselves to realize, oh my goodness, I already have everything I could possibly want. I already mm -hmm. have and possess everything that I could even conceive of wanting. And so therefore, again, it, we come up to this very simple, but simple doesn't mean easy because there's so much habit going away. This very simple conclusion, just open, relax, rest in the nature of who you are right now, the goodness of who you are right now. And you will come, I, I, as a proponent of these wisdom traditions, you will echo this radical proclamation that, oh my goodness, I already have, I already am, Everything I could possibly want is already right here. I just need to open myself to it. So I think it's a wonderful way to come full circle, to close on a, a note of tremendous optimism and positivity, and also really radical simplicity that really take a look deep within and see if this is not true for you. Yeah. Andrew, it's been a pleasure to have you on Silent Ego um, in partnership with Zengility.life, um, the soul of the entrepreneur. Uh, you are definitely a soul and, uh, you know, uh, the messages are wise messages. I'm sure our listeners and viewers today have really enjoyed this. Long may it continue. And I always sort of feel the best is yet to come. Isn't it? Isn't it? And just to <laughs> yeah. say, you know, again, I, I merged you with Ben because you and Ben are of one mind. So exactly. For, so, therefore, that little slip at the beginning was just yeah. an information that you guys are of one heart and mind. And thank you again, Paul and Ben, for the opportunity to spend some time with you. Again, I applaud so much what you're doing, and it's great to be a small part of it. Thank you. Thank you.